All right, hello everybody. This is James Stanley with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. Please type in a Y if my voice is coming through. And as soon as we have confirm on audiovisual, we'll get this session started. Majid from Oman, good to see you, my friend. All right, fantastic. Looks like we have a room full of uh, good regulars. Good to see you, ladies and gentlemen, back. Hope that the week has treated you well so far. Um, uh, Pete, Andy, Majid, Hans, Manir, Mauricio, Moreno, uh, Grace, and I'm sorry, there's too many to list today, but thank you so much for uh, your time in advance. Today, we're going to take a look at some of these yen trends. It looks like a little bit of life is coming back into that um, that prior theme of yen weakness. And given some of the commotion that we might see in the U.S. dollar over the next, let's say, 24 hours, maybe even a little longer, I thought it might be smart to take a step back and look elsewhere. Um, of course, we will touch on the dollar. It looks as though that dollar trend is trying to come back as well. Um, but I didn't want that to be the meat and potatoes of today's session, given that there is some uncertainty around tomorrow's inauguration and what exactly might happen there. Uh, but as usual, this session is all about you. So please don't hesitate to type in any questions I might be able to help with that are trading related. I'll certainly do my best uh, to answer those here in the Q&A portion of the webinar, which I have planned for about 20 to 30 minutes on the back end of the session. So let's get started. Uh, as usual, any questions, throw them my way, and we'll see what we can do. Uh, risk disclaimer part one, we are going to look at trading, which is risky. If you're not familiar with that, please take a few moments to familiarize yourself with it. And we'll move on in just about 15 seconds. And risk disclaimer part two, the hypothetical trading disclaimer. We're going to look at some past trades. We're going to look at some strategy. Anytime we do that, we have to know past performance is not indicative of future results. I'm going to give this another 10 seconds. And then we shall move on. All right, let's rock and roll. Um, so as mentioned, it looks like some of these yen trends are beginning to come back. And I wanted to start off with a focus here on the one-hour chart of dollar yen. And you know what I was referring to there is the fact that we had this prior little batch of swings. And again, we're on an hourly chart, so it's a day, day and a half of the swings here just uh, earlier in the week. And that gave us a fairly consistent swing high before we went on to make a lower low. So lower high, lower to low. Uh, but yesterday, we got a quick burst of strength in this setup after Chair Yellen had offered some comments to markets. Uh, Chair Yellen had taken the podium and essentially echoed what she had said in December. So there wasn't a whole lot of change from what Miss Yellen had said in December to what she said today, or yesterday, rather. But it was, in my opinion at least, it was almost somewhat of a reminder of the predominant theme that is taking place in markets right now, which is monetary divergence. Because even if the U.S. doesn't kick up a full three rate hikes this year, and a full three next year, well, they're still a lot closer to tighter policy options than what we're seeing out of Japan. So if we're looking at just pure delta of where these monetary regimes are expected to go, the U.S. expected to tighten, get more hawkish, as we see more signs of recovery, whereas Japan is likely still going to be investigating the looser side of the monetary coin. So it does have that prospect of longer-term continued divergence, and I think that's one of the reasons that the Trump trade showed here so incredibly strong. A quick lurch up, and notice there was very little give back in this trend on the way up, and you know it was until we New Year failed to pop above this high that questions started to abound about sustainability of this move, right? Whether the Trump trade had gone overbought, etc., and, and maybe it had. But we've had a decent little pullback, a decent little retracement here, and it looks as though the yen is beginning to get back into that 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 paradigm of weakness that's very much been its kind of default template since the election. Now let's go down a little bit tighter. Again, I don't want to do too much on the U.S. dollar, given the potential for some erratic chaos tomorrow. Uh, but I want to use this as somewhat of a proxy so that I could extrapolate this over into other yen pairs. Okay. Now, what we have on the four-hour chart is still a very early bull move as we broke above the swing high. Notice we just barely peaked above, right? Buyers got, got a, quite a bit more quiet once we tested that resistance at 115.50, okay? So still bullish, 
It's just checked bullishness at this point. Now, if I want to look at a continuation approach right now, I can investigate a really tight stop right here underneath, underneath this batch of support. Okay. We have this 114 level, or just about 114, so Fibonacci level had given us a good dash of support when price action was on its way down before we had bottomed out, worked back up. But given that we have a higher low above what had previously been a pivotal point of support, it's going to offer me an aggressive entry. Okay, so I'd want to get the stop underneath this swing right here. That was the peak of the retracement, right? Well, trough, technically. So I want to get that stop nested below that swing. Because if I put the stop right of the swing, every market maker on planet Earth knows that. And they know there's probably some stops sitting there at that low. I want to nest it, get a little bit deeper. Okay, now if I'm doing that, I'm taking on about 80 pips of risk. The big question is, can I look for or see, you know, foreseeably see 100 or more on the upside to make that 80 pips worthwhile? And I think if, if we do... See this retracement, this near-term retracement cut, like right around here? I think that that's a fairly realistic possibility to look for 100, 120 on the upside. This swing right up here, only 1685. It's about 170 pips of distance from current price action. I wouldn't want to put the target again right at the top of the swing. I'd want to nest it a little bit inside. You know, so more reasonably look for about 140, 150 of upside. And, and that's something that I think could work if comfortable taking on dollar risk around tomorrow's inauguration, which again, it's you know, a very difficult factor to prognosticate around. A lot of this, <laughs> a lot of around this election has been that way. Um, so I don't think that we all of a sudden want to start expecting it to become predictable. But that's the way that I could set this up in the US dollar. The pound yen is a little bit more clean as far as that's concerned because we've seen that additional burst of strength this week in the British pound after Theresa May's Brexit speech and this to me is a pretty interesting setup at the moment <clears throat> okay so kind of the same story is that US presidential election that really was the game changer here right there's that mass reversal that took place around the election November 9th Notice on the night of the election, we had made this low in the 126s. And then just a little over a month later, we're at 148, almost 148 and a half. So just a gargantuan run in a really short period of time. And again, this was really just on the basis of, of the election. Possible paradigm shift in that US dollar policy. Now, as this was moving up, we got pretty overbought. As a matter of fact, we could even incorporate, say, like RSI, which I'm not usually a big fan of, especially for timing, but for, you know, detecting overbought natures in a market, I think it could be really beneficial, you know, but notice how RSI was diverging so hard off this daily chart, right? We set the higher high on RSI right here, right? As we made that quick swing at about 141.52, and then make a higher high on price, lower high on RSI. Notice how it's just grinding, right? Significant high here on price, another lower high here on RSI. So it really just highlights how incredibly overbought that trend had become on the basis of that hope back in December. So to my eyes, seeing a retracement that cuts 50% of that move before finding support isn't necessarily all that much of a bearish factor. If we would have went significantly below 135, I would have gotten a little bit more worried. But we all knew that Theresa May's Brexit speech was coming out <clears throat> this week. So when Pound Yen opened for trading on Sunday, notice we gapped down to this FIB level uh, right at 136.63. And this FIB, fairly easy to find, take the swing low right after the flash crash and take that up to the high in, uh, on December 15th. The 50 FIB is right here. Notice how prices had tried to catch support on the 38.2, did not hold. But that support did. Now it's led into four straight days of gains. So if I want to look for, I don't want to call it a fast mover, but a more volatile way of looking for that yen weakness, this is probably one of the areas that I want to look to do it in, given that we also have the potential for reversal of the macro backdrop behind the British pound. 
right? We had that worry around Theresa May's Brexit speech as we came to the week. Brexit speech appears to have been really well received, given the fact that we've had four consecutive days of strength against the yen, and then I mean we could even extrapolate that over here in the dollar and notice how the net impact has been on the strength here as well, right? Theresa May's Brexit speech retraced yesterday. Now it looks like price action is trying to catch a higher low or off a prior zone of resistance. So bullish, right? So there's a very realistic prospect that this theme of bullishness may continue on the back of the fact that Brexit may not be as hard as what many were fearing. Because what was it that really had a lot of people concerned about hard Brexit? It was just uncertainty. We didn't have a lot of facts. Theresa May hadn't been extremely forthcoming in how she was planning on executing Brexit because she had just taken over the job of PM of a very large country and economy. But now that she does open up a little bit more on some of these details of how she's looking to execute Brexit, we have a little bit more certainty. Neither here nor there, but that, that additional certainty could lead to reversal that prior bearish trend in the British pound. So a couple of different things lining up from an attractive basis there. <laughs> Pete says, I recall your tweets on deeper levels on Gepi. I was even surprised it got to the 136 level. Yeah, when I saw this thing gap down, I was, uh, you know, I was pretty much expecting 135 test, but uh, did not happen. Ended up coming up a little bit, uh, a little bit tighter than that. Yeah, pretty, pretty astounding how far this fell so fast, right? But we're still at all points more than 50% higher than we were at that, or 50% of the move from that early October low. Now. If I want to treat this a bit more conservatively, because again, we just made a quick lurch higher. If I want to go a little bit more conservatively on this, what I can do is I can focus in on the retracement move itself to try to determine when the retracement is done. Let's go ahead and get rid of this oscillator. It's valuable chart real estate. Don't want to waste it. I can focus in on the retracement period itself. Okay. So notice that retracement started here December 15. We set the low right here. Now if I want to just dial in on it a little bit more, what I can do here is set a FIB retracement on the retracement move itself right in here. And then I could use that 50% FIB retracement level to denote that the retracement, the subtrend of the major trend is done. Okay? Because if we pop above 50%, of this downward move, then I could reasonably say that this downward move is done. Now it also happens that this level, the 50% FIB on the retracement, comes in at a pretty interesting spot. It's just a few pips underneath the psychological level at 142.5. It's all got a, a significant swing low right here on January 5th. Now I want to Note, this swing low did not happen because of this Fibonacci retracement, because this move had not even been established yet. We hadn't yet set the low. So we can't imagine that this bounce came because of the 50% Fib retracement of a retracement move that hadn't yet completed. Okay? It's mere observational. Um, maybe not even say coincidental. Sure, I've hit the nail on the head here, but the confluence might make it a more valid level. Boom. Multiple reasons for support to show up here, right? Not only do I have the 50 fib, I also have a psychological level just a few pips off. I got a price swing right here. I got a price swing that was a little bit messier right here. But notice even on the way up, <clears throat> December the 4th, which, nope, the uh, BOE Super Thursday was a month earlier. I can't remember exactly what news report was here. Maybe there wasn't one, but. Again, another significant price action bounce, right? So this 142.50 level has been noteworthy in pound yen, you know, especially over this most recent run. If I did want to take a more conservative tilt towards such an observation, I could make sure, or I could wait to make sure that I don't get a resistant swing off this level as we'd had support swings off of this level, right? Because if I am looking to get long on this thing, <clears throat> I get long and then it bounces, well, then it's probably going to cut a stop or two. Again, the more conservative way to play it, let it run. 
I got another level here at 142.87. This is maybe a secondary level of resistance, so that real short term, right? If we break above, look for some sellers to come in and then see how buyers respond to this level to see if it does become support. Okay, more conservative way of playing it. Pound yen when stretched, mileage may vary. Be very careful. But nonetheless, it does look as though we're seeing a dash of bullishness come back into the pair, and then a dash of bearishness come into some of these yen trends, which in my opinion is really encouraging. Let's go over to Europe. So we had ECB this morning, and it wasn't really a whole lot that I think was being expected, um, but it did sound as though Mario Draghi had done a you know pretty good job of laying the fact that the bank may have some additional dovishness in the cards. So let's just take a quick quick look at Euro dollar. Here we go. Okay, so the initial response in this morning's ECB announcement was one of weakness, but it, was, it, it to me it seemed very tempered because we didn't even test this prior swing low. I mean, I was watching this on Twitter, and then you know when we had an 80 pip drop, it, you started to see the parity calls coming back out again, and it didn't seem all that prominent to me. Now, the level that's really important on Euro dollar right now, in my opinion, <clears throat> is this multi-year bear flag. It's still there. Uh, real simply, we could find the support element of this bear flag by connecting the low from March of 2015 to the low of December of 2015, and then projecting that. I notice November, December last year gave us a pretty decent bounce. But what's more interesting to me is the way that this has come in as intraday support and resistance on numerous occasions. Okay, so on an hourly chart now, notice the price action was just dropping like a rock here back in November. And support showed up, right? And, and notice how this like continually happened. Now it's not perfect, it's not beautiful, but it's a trend line projection, which will often be messy. But this level continued to cut support and resistance. And, and this morning, that ECB announcement merely brought us down to that support level so the buyers could respond. So I, I'm still harboring that view of potential bullishness in the not too distant future of the euro. And not necessarily because there's any bullish factors going on within the economy, so much as there are likely going to be less monetary accommodation after March when, when the first QE program completes. It's effectively a taper. Started with 80 a month, then we had 80 plus 60 a month. After March, it's only 60 a month. So just numerically, that is a taper. 80 to 140 to 60. It's tapering. It's just mathematical. But maybe more to the point, with the ECB already having thrown two very big pitches at this thing, do they have enough strength to throw a third that could actually break it down towards that parity level? I don't think they can. Now, taking this argument over into a pair that does not include the US dollar, can bring me over here to the Euro Yen. There we go. I knew I already had one drawn up. Euro Yen right in here. Okay, so kind of the same thing, right? Around that, around the U.S. presidential election, we saw that reversal on election night, led into a really firm bout of yen weakness. But what really had me excited about this one throughout December was the fact that when we did see the ECB throw that kitchen sink at the problem, and this was basically a one-two combo of ECB and the Fed, when we saw that. All that really happened was a test of a prior support level right here. December 8th was ECB. They threw another leg of QE at the problem. And it simply got us a support test here on Euro Yen. Buyers were basically waiting for bad news on the Euro so that they could pick up the Yen when it was rather expensive. Selling some Yen by buying Euros. This would help us establish the support. Now, as the overbought nature or oversold nature of some of these yen trends started to come in question, that's when we finally see this, saw the support right down here. Catch a test. Okay. 
It's going a little bit tighter. This one's a little less close to ready for me, but I still have it. I still have it on the menu. Okay. So there's the ECB swing low from December. Notice how support tried to come in. When this thing slid through, I started to get a little more cautious. But it came right back. Quick little burst. Again, that was yesterday, right around Yellen's speech. So yeah, sure, Yellen doesn't control monetary policy on the euro or the yen, but are inextricably related. Quick higher high. Notice we've got a support check on this fib level of 121.95. And so the near-term price action behavior here appears to exhibit, or is exhibiting, bullish tendencies. And just really, on a quick basis, you can see where buyers are trying to catch support on a messy zone of prior resistance. Personally, I wouldn't even trifle with that right now. Europe's already closed towards the end of a trading day, inaugurations tomorrow. But the fact that we had this quick higher high, to me, shows the market's hand. That we are seeing somewhat of a impetus of a bullish bias come into the pair. Now, one of the reasons that I'm more tempered here than when I'm on pound yen is the fact that this prior range had seen a considerable number of sellers come in just a little bit north of where we are on price right now. Now, this is going to be pretty wide, but the point here is to keep me out of a devastating trade. So wide it shall be. But notice this resistance zone, almost 100 pips, right? But of recent, this has been the longest 100 pips in Euro Yen's life, well, probably since the election. But notice how the markets had a proclivity to exhibit some extremely profound resistance once we've gotten above this 123 level. And I mean, this is for a, was for a while, you know, since early December. Even with that ECB move. So as long as we have this, I don't want to look for any profits north of 123.09. Because sure, we might break above, but I have the fear that it'd be a fleeting type of observation. So instead, what I want to do is I want to take profits short of that 123 level. And I want to try to buy this thing near support here if it reconfirms. Okay? Because we have seen some tests come back here. But, you know, just a couple of days earlier, we had seen this thing sell off and break through that support level. Which means that I might be running in to a lower high. So I still want to move forward a little bit more conservatively here. I don't want to get as excited by the momentum here because frankly the momentum over the longer term hasn't been as strong as what I've seen in pound yen. But one pair or another pair where I still do like that macro bias because it looks as though the Bank of Japan may have more of an ability to do more on the monetary stimulus front than what Europe has as it's already pretty extended. So that's Euro yen. Aussian. Aussian's coming up on a big, big level. Let's, uh, let's walk down the chart chain there. Okay. So I'm starting off with a monthly chart. The What I consider the most significant major move or the big picture major move here is this high in 2007 to this low in 2008, which, you know, to me, surprisingly, was a range that lasted about a year. Notice this high was set October of 2007. This low was set October of 2008. So literally within a year, we set a major range that has yet to be violated on Euro Yen. So to me, that's held really well. But also notice this uh, on this monthly price action behavior. Now we've seen quite a few support and resistance inflections coming in at this level, or at these levels. Key of which has been the 618 here at 8763, which is also just about 14 pips north of another psychological level at 8750. There we go. Again, confluence. All right, let's go down a little tighter. Weekly chart. Again, same kind of thing. There's the Trump trade. There's the December high. Have you been able to take that out? All right, now when we walk down a little further, here we go. So this is a trend line. I don't want to get too excited about it because we had quite a bit of mess 
right here in the middle. But given the proximity of these recent resistance tests, it feels like there's something going on to me there. I don't know exactly what. But when I notice something, the what is usually less important than the why. I guess the why is less important than the what. So I don't really want to get bullish on this until this can significantly break above that 8750 level. That's you know essentially been the highest high that we've had since January of 2016, so for a year. Right, because notice right in here. Right, very much like what we were looking at above 12309 on Euro Yen, where it's you know a higher cost to carry when we are up near these resistance levels. Right? We had a quick breach above back in December, and this is when everything was getting really excited about the Trump trade. And we're back above there now, so I don't want to do too much buying just yet. But going down short term, if we can find some element of support at one of those prior areas of resistance, I can look to trade it with a relatively tight stop below the prior swing. But preferably, I want to see this price break above that high to prove the bulls will be able to take control of the situation. At that point, I look to buy a retracement or buy support. And when we have a level that's as strong or as, as, as novel as we have here at 87.64, this becomes a very opportune place to look for that. So in this one, I actually want to let price blow by it to prove the bulls will be able to break it. And then once that happens, that punches my ticket to start looking for support, which I could do within the zone between 87.50, 87.64. Okay, I have one setup, and I'm going to draw it up here right in front of you, where I'm actually open to yin strength. And it's somewhat of a response to the Bank of Canada rate decision or Bank of Canada statement from yesterday. At yin. So... Surprisingly, one of the strongest currencies in the world in 2016 was the Canadian dollar. And this is, you know, fresh on the heels of some pretty interesting issues that we're seeing in Canada at the beginning of the year from a very weak currency. So in a short period of time, I think it was around January 20th, that reversal in dollar CAD started, brought a considerable amount of strength into the CAD to the point where it erase some of the benefit that the Canadian economy would have gotten off those higher oil prices. But what really makes the CAD interesting, and let's just do this over on dollar CAD, what really makes the CAD interesting was what happened on October 15th, or excuse me, October 19th. This was the October BOC statement. And as we came into that statement, of course, nobody was looking for a rate hike or move on rates, but there was kind of like a latent, um, kind of, you know, under the surface hope or thought that the BOC would eventually be looking at some form of monetary stimulus, right? Because about a strength that was this significant, it brought some problems into the Canadian economy. So in October, Stephen Polos, in the middle of that rate decision, or the middle of his press conference after the rate decision where they did nothing, drops the line that the Bank of Canada discussed the prospect of monetary stimulus. Got folks real excited, real quick. CAD sells off. Notice leads into a fairly clean move up to resistance level at 35.75. But then Stephen Polos walked that back. He said, this isn't something we're looking to do today or tomorrow or next meeting. So something we're looking, I think he said about 18 months. And, you know, when he did that, it, you know, really kind of tapped the brakes on, you know, that hope of divergence between these two very major economies. U.S. looking at tighter policy options, and if Canada was, in fact, looking at looser policy options, well, then that could let this thing really fly, like we'd seen right there in the early portion, mid-portion of October. But he successfully walked that back. Now, yesterday, Mr. Poles made a similar mention of monetary stimulus, albeit not as concerted. But what's changed since then is we've had a considerable amount of additional confirmation that the U.S. is likely going to be seeing tighter rate policy. Trump election came and went. The markets did not collapse. 
So the Fed still feels confident about that fact. Uh, rate hike in December. We got it. Nothing collapsed. We're all still here. And the Fed said they're looking for three this year. And markets are broadly supportive of that theme. So the bullish thesis for the U.S. dollar has gotten considerably stronger than that previous mention of Canadian monetary stimulus back in October. So the argument made that deviation not only still exists, but maybe even is a little bit more attractive. So I could take that theme of potential for weakness in the Canadian dollar on the back of the fact that BOC is essentially struggling with a strong CAD at the moment. And I could extrapolate it over into a yen strength thesis so that if I did have to buy the yen against anything, I would do it against the one currency that may have an impetus of additional weakness after this week's central bank announcements. Now, what also makes this interesting to me from a technical perspective is that we're starting to see this, this isn't a proper term, we're starting to see this wiggle out of this prior bullish move. And by wiggle, what I mean is we came up and set a higher high, and we came down and set a higher low that resisted or that supported off prior resistance. Trend resumption move fell short. We set a lower high right in here. Now prices have come down. We had yesterday's BOC. That's what created that reversal in the CAD. But notice all that, that gave us here on CAD yen was a doji. That had previous uh, that it, that it slightly cut below previous support. So it may be trying to angle for a move lower. Now how aggressively, I don't know. But again, this is one of the few theses that I could come anywhere close to for a strong yin type of outlay. Let's go down a little tighter to see how we could trade this, given that it could be the, in essence, the perspective of a new trend. Okay. Higher high, higher low, right in there. These could still be usable levels. We don't know yet. I'm going to see the way that near-term price action behaves. We get the lower high right in there. Quick lower low right in there. So that, to me, is like an early warning sign. The bulls may be weaning. They might be getting a little bit weaker, a little more discouraged, right? And, you know, kind of imagine like that. When we're in an uptrend, general sentiment is bullish and strong and positive and happy and all that good stuff. We see a support test. It's still rather positive. But when we get that breach of support, that's when folks start to get a little more worried because there wasn't enough buyers sitting on the sidelines. And we had the subsequent support test to keep it from breaking below. Sellers were able to outnumber them, albeit temporarily. So even though price did come back, the fact that we had a breach of support is in and of itself bearish. Let's dial in a little bit tighter. So you can see after that breach of support, buyers ended up coming back, right? And even took control of this for a little while. But notice as we neared this prior point of resistance, the sellers that were on the sidelines said, hey, we just popped a new low. They said, I'm going to sell that, stop above these swings. Gets us moving right back down. Now the big question is, are those buyers that we're supporting here, have they gotten more aggressive or more bullish to support here? Right, because we had a quick little swing low earlier in the session. You can see we're on this hourly bar right here. We dipped down and already getting some wick action. Buyers coming in to respond. So what I could do, real simple. Very similar to what I was looking to do on that pound yen setup, where I could trade it inside, I could trade it outside. If I want to trade it outside, I've already got a little bit of innuendo to work with. And the outside way of trading this move is let price pop below this swing to denote the bears could take further control and then wait for price to pop back up so that I could sell lower high resistance, which will often come in at a prior level of support. And if not at this swing low, then I could look at this swing low. It gives me a nice little zone to work with. It's just about 30 pips, 25 pips wide. That's the outside way of trading the move. And, you know, a good example of outside way of trading the move happened right here. Right, we had that prior swing low right here. Notice price action broke below, and so that's like the activator to say, hey, sellers have the potential to take control here. At that point, I want to wait for resistance, which will often come in at a prior level of support or resistance, as it did right here, and that give me a reload entry. 
kind of the same thing possible here on the outside way of trading this move. Now on the inside way of trading this move, I would look for this support, this near term short support to hold. I would look for price action to break back above to this prior little zone of resistance at about 86 and three quarters. And as long as I can get a wick, and I would even extend this up a little bit more, as long as I can get a wick within about this 25 pip zone right in here, I could look at that as a reversal opportunity to sell a short-term spike to take it lower by putting a stop above these swing highs. And again, I want to nest it, don't want to put it right at 87 flat. So that if we do see a continuation of that bullish momentum, fantastic. If we don't, we get a new high, get me out really quick. I don't want to sit around and watch my equity get depleted by a really bad trade. So that, my friends, is what I have for today. Uh, I want to see what kind of questions you ladies and gentlemen have. I, I purposely stayed away from the dollar, or too much, around the dollar. So uh, feel free to fire your best bullets at me. <laughs> um, from Pete, a uh, great write-up on Gepi, by the way. It's a mover, I think, longer term as well. Uh, yes, sir. I think it's a pretty exciting setup just because of the, I guess you could say, the macro dichotomy between the two. And, you know, both of these economies have some major macro themes, you know, kind of bursting at the seams at the moment. And, uh, you know, that usually makes for some pretty wild markets. The article that Pete was referring to is right here. It's uh, pound yen, technical analysis, 142.50 to market retracement completion. Now, uh, I just put that link in the chat box. And I am going to send out an email tomorrow. So if you want to join my email distribution list, would love to have you on there. Of course, it is free. Uh, I also promise to never spam you. I uh, might send it a maximum one, two, or maybe three emails a week, but you're never going to get more than more than one from me in a single day. I hate getting them, so I'm not going to do it to you. Um, but I also usually try to write a little something extra in there that isn't in the articles as a thank you for uh, joining my distribution list. Uh, from Pete, looking at Aussie pairs, China GDP, and uh, please cover USD. I'm sure you will. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I tried to throw a little bit of a curveball there, right? Um, yeah, Aussie. Let's, let's, uh, let's actually do a tops down on this one. Because I'm still, uh, you know, feeling like I'm zigging where the world's zagging on this pair. And, you know, I just haven't had a real clear set of eyes on it. And the reason that I think that is, I think I'm looking at the wrong periodicity. I think that the, the theme on Aussie right now is taking place here on the monthly. And uh, like I said, let's do a tops down. We'll start cradle to grave and we'll work this one. All right. So, again, you know, game changing move from 2001 here to the top in uh, 2011. That, of course, is going to be the big picture major move. I'm going to go right here. So notice right off the bat, you know, some of this variated price action we've seen over about the last month. Well, we see why now, right? It's right there within that, uh, right there within that FIB set up there, support 71.84. Uh, not quite resistance, but here I got, got something that's going to show that to us. All right, so that's the big picture major move, helping to set near-term support. Notice monthly support right now here, 71.84. That's where it comes from. Um, also, right off the bat, there's a trend line right in here, right? You can see these swings just jutting out of price action like that. There, there can often be something going on. So we got a trend line to work with. Now, you know, whenever we get a setup like this, the devil's in the details, okay? Notice if I use this swing right here, I get some subsequent inflections but which is the right swing here I don't know I don't think anybody does know it's 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 it's, it's not perfect there's a lot of subjectivity in this stuff if I use that low however now this one looks quite a bit better this looks to be the one that if we are seeing projected trades coming off of this, this looks to be the one that's a little bit more active, right? Look at the way that it cuts through these wicks in September, October, November, and December of 2015. The way that it, it cuts through and catches the bottom right here, um, July of 2016, September of 2016. Uh, resistance just last month. 
right? So something that, that could be workable here, right? I'm never going to you know, place a huge bet on a trend line holding, but it's something that could become usable, especially on an intraday basis. There's another move we need to fib up here, though. We've got another major move from this swing low up to that swing high. It's my secondary major move. There we go. Have a whole numerical system. I want it to be color coded just 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 so. Alright, so pretty cool, right? Now that you see that we've got the secondary major move added, which is basically taking the financial collapse lows to that same 2011 high, look at the amount of confluence that we have within these two what have been very pensive zones. Both of these levels line up with a strong element of confluence. Let's go down a little tighter daily chart. There we go. So like I was saying a little earlier, this thing seems jumbled to me. It doesn't seem as clean. Well, we ran into a batch of really strong confluence support, which ended that downtrend. Now price action is popping right back up. And we have what could be a really strong level of confluent resistance just a little bit above current price action. So again, I think this is more of a longer term play, or at least that's that's the way that I'm looking at it. Um, my bias here, if I have to take one, is still to the short side. You know, we had a long term major move come down to run into a really big level of support, and you know, we could still be seeing some resolution around that support. Um, you know, but if anything, I would feel much more confident selling, you know, some element of short term resistance simply because we're near to these points of resistance uh, or, or longer term resistance that I could use for stop placement. If I had to fit something in on Aussie dollar right now, that's that's just about how I do it. But you know something doesn't feel clean to me, I'm just gonna you know go over and go to something that's maybe a little bit more workable. I think a key part to survival in markets is knowing which fights to avoid. And if I don't feel comfortable on a chart or a setup, I'm just gonna next it find something else. You know, but uh Aussie's still kind of in that in that category for me. I want to see resolution of that longer term move before I'm going to do anything too confident. Uh, from uh, Lucas Van Heck, uh, how do you think Trump's inauguration will affect the markets tomorrow? You know, it's it, the tough part about it is is that there's really small sample size on it. You know, this is a really rather new thing, at least for me. Um, you know, seeing a presidential candidate that has such an impact on markets, that it is something that I think you need to take as a negative risk factor more than anything right up front because you don't know exactly how that's going to end up hitting your trades. You know, you don't know exactly how you could plan around, you know, trying to trade in front of something Trump's going to tweet about. So I think that it should, at least initially, um, exude a considerable amount of caution. But, you know, in all honesty, I don't see Trump taking a, you know, a, a bearish dollar or bearish U.S. stance. I think that the model that I'd be looking at for tomorrow would be his acceptance speech on election night. The big difference, of course, is on election night, when that acceptance speech happened, we were at support after markets had just bolted lower on the fear of a Trump presidency. Now it's, it's somewhat of the opposite end of that paradigm, where markets are a bit overpriced still. Um, you know, and this is something we talked about in December where valuations are just getting to extreme expensive levels. And, you know, that Trump trade is well priced in the markets already. So I do think it will end up on net being stock positive. It might, it might actually get us a lower low before we can get there. But I think end of the day, it's going to be a near term positive for the U.S. Now, longer term, I think there's a big question because. It, it, to me, it seems like there's kind of a disconnect here, right? The primary factor that kept this thing bullish for so long was the prospect of the Federal Reserve ready, willing, and able to come to markets with relief if markets did crash or collapse, right? So in essence, to me, QE, TARP, it, it all felt like a way of preventing one of these. And when investors have the confidence that they're not going to have to get hit by one of these, much more, much more of a strong reason to buy stocks. 
Now, more recently, these, these pullbacks have been getting a bit more aggressive, right? Like we had this one back in 2011, that led into QE2. Excuse me, that led into Operation Twist. This was QE2. 2010, that led into QE2. This led into Operation Twist. Then we had that big, big move. But after QE's ended, the expansion on these retracements has gotten a bit deeper. Well, now we've just flown up to the top side and the prospect of this thing just continuing to run all the way up there, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I think if anything, we're gonna need to see this quiet down a little bit, build more of a support base, reestablish sentiment before it's ready to shoot higher. Um, but you know, more to the point, that one factor that it kept market supported on the way up, it's no longer as bullish. Fed's hiking rates, they're looking at, you know, getting even more aggressive on rate policy, normalization. So we've at least removed one of these positive factors, right? Now the other, other positive factor that really blew this thing through its top was the hope around Trumponomics. And I think that is just a very opaque factor right now because fiscal policy usually takes a long time to get to work. Um, when I was learning economics, monetary policy was designed for half-life inside of a year. Fiscal policy was all that designed for more than a year. We've gotten pretty used to the monetary side of the coin over the past eight years, and now that we're focusing on fiscal, it's, it's as if a lot of folks have forgotten that it takes a long time to get fiscal policy to show results, and that's what they're seeing in Canada right now. It's one of the reasons the BOC took a backseat to, to dovish policy options back in January. That's what brought so much strength into the CAD. So, you know, there, there is the opportunity for a disconnect, for um, a vacuum, if you will, where we don't have either of those bullish factors really producing anything tangible that, that could allow for a test of support, you know, down here around the 1850 level. And I know that's a big, big move, but the downside of markets usually cuts quite a bit faster than the upside builds. I think the old saying is that like it takes 30 minutes to wipe away three months worth of gains. Uh, so that's just my, my best, best, best uh, my best guess on the matter, Lucas. Um, you know, if anything, I, I'd expect it to come out with an element of positivity. You know, as to how we get there, that's the bigger question. That's what's going to be more interesting. That's uh, maybe one of the reasons I think so many people are going to tune in tomorrow. Uh, from Chris R, thoughts on dollar CAD? Yeah, finally, finally found a support. Um, you know, I, I think this is one of the centerpieces that we looked at on Tuesday, uh, and maybe even last week. But that 130 level, it keeps coming back as you know, pretty strong level of hardline support. Uh, to me, it was really cool how we came so close to testing that low from December, or excuse me, uh, October, uh, just yesterday, before we got that really, really aggressive bounce. Um, Near-term price action, I wouldn't be chasing this right now, Thursday, ahead of inauguration, ahead of a weekend, but, you know, case to be made for looking for that higher low support from right around 132.80, maybe 132.70, up to 133.13, this to me is a really good level at uh, 133.13 or excuse me, 133.12, which uh, can simply be had by just drawing a fib retracement around that most recent major move from that January top down to that May low. That one right in there, and uh, 32s right there. Uh, so constructively bullish. <laughs> Pete, oh please, really, parody chicken squawking. <laughs> you know, so this is this is pretty funny. There's another one of these, you know, really, uh, uh, you know widely discussed topic is going on right now with the Dow and 20,000 and you know it was it was getting a bit nauseating for me for a week hearing you know all the major media talk about can the Dow get 20,000 can the Dow get 20,000 you know and when I teach about psychological support and resistance points that that is what makes them a thing the human obsession with psychologically rounded values what does 20,000 have the 19999 doesn't or the 20001 does Nothing. They're all numbers, all in the same. One's rounded, so it elicits more, say, behavioral reformatting. <laughs> One isn't rounded, so it's, it's, it's less noteworthy. Um, but parity is very much like that, you know, across the currency landscape, you know? And 
I remember when this thing was dropping like a rock back in March 2015. You know, that was the big call. A lot of the major banks were out there. Oh, parity. Sure, parity. And, you know, when everybody's watching for something, expecting that it will happen, in many cases it doesn't. And, you know, again, you know, Dow 20K, you know, there's a good chance it may not happen. It's trying. Valiant efforts. Right? Valiant efforts. It just couldn't get it. It's almost as if there's a really smart trader out there that realizes that everybody's focused on this 20K level, fixated on that 20K level. And so as we get closer, they're going to try to buy, buy, buy to drive it up. Expectation that they're going to hit 20K and just sell, close out. So if that's me, well, when we get these deeper dips, I'm accumulating a position, and then when price comes back to test 20K, I'm selling, 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 selling into all that retail money that's trying to buy it up to a new high. It's almost as if somebody knows that. There's a good book on the matter called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. It looks at markets from a vantage point of microstructure, which I think is a really interesting way of looking about it, uh, looking at one of these issues. Because there's always two sides to a market, right? If you're buying, somebody's selling it to you. Maybe it's through a specialist, maybe it's through a NASDAQ quote, maybe it's through a Forex platform, whatever it is, but there's somebody on the other side of that. And then if you've shown me your cards and I know what your strategy is and what you're trying to do, like you're trying to take the Dow Jones up to 20K so that you can hit a limit and then go on vacation, if I know that you're looking to do that, I can use that against you by doing exactly what I was talking about. It comes down to find support, I accumulate a position, which thereby that demand helps to begin to drive the price back up. But as price gets back up towards that 20K figure, and as I see those retail traders saying, oh, we're at 19,909, 20K is just a day away. As that starts to happen, well, then I reverse my stance and I sell my long position into those new bulls. What does that mean? Well, that means that my supply could offset some of that additional demand that's pushing price higher so that we can't break any higher. And 20K never happens. Now, I want to put a caveat here. I do not trade with anywhere near the size to do anything like this, which is why I said there might be one really smart person out there, one really smart hedge fund or bank or whatever. But you know, we're talking about a market that's pretty massive, and I'm nowhere near the level to be able to do that. But when I'm setting up one of those trades, that's what goes into my mind. Is there somebody really smart over there that's executing a smarter game theory strategy than I am? Hence, a lot of the psychological levels never come to fruition. Well, some. Let's not say a lot. That implies majority. Uh, from Pete, uh, Aussie Yen looks more mature in the move than Pound Yen on the weekly. Very similar with Yen weakness starting to play out. Yeah, it. Uh, I think next BOJ meeting is January 31st. So you know, I think I think we're getting pretty close there. Um, but you know, to me, when we see a really robust trend, it makes sense to see some element of retracement. The, the thing that I was probably most surprised about is those Yen trends did not retrace sooner. Um, that was that was. It was pretty surprising to me that it lasted for so long. Uh, from Shrift, what do you think about playing this through Pound CAD? That cross is not going to be liquid enough for me to really feel comfortable on it. You know, especially with some of the major macro issues that are going on with the UK right now. You know, because the fear that I have in trading across in the first place is always going to be liquidity. And, you know, again, and it's not like I'm trading in a size where I'm worried about you know, getting getting hit on the price on the way out. Uh, more so, I'm worried about a lack of liquidity when we get a really big market moving event, you know, like a flash crash type of event or a Brexit type of event. You know, and if there's less liquidity in that market, it's just even more vulnerable for an erratic price break against me. It's one headline reason I might be a little more tepid to do anything in pound cat at the moment. Looking at the price action set up here, though, you know I would still be cautious here, my friend. It came into a pretty good little level of support here, right around 165. All right, notice how we caught support there for a couple of weeks, about 165, and then it just slid through. Uh, there's the gap, and now it looks like this thing's just bursting higher. 
I do like the prospect of both of these macro backdrops, uh, backdrops coming through with a little bit more of a reversal type of theme. But this thing's moved too far too fast for me to get really excited about buying it. You know, because basically my stop would need to be about 650 pips away for me to trade it off the daily. Trend line. You know, so there's a reason the support could come in here. Oh, there we go. And you can see where it's, you know, it, the train feels like it's already left the station. I needed to make a stop. See how crowded it is before I'm going to jump back on there. You know, especially given, you know, those concerns about liquidity around UK events, inauguration, and quite a bit of volatility that's been showing up in the Canadian dollar. I'd be careful. But that, you know, again, just goes back to my style of not really being too heavy on the crosses. Uh, from Victoria Hilford, my Fibonacci retracement on several charts. Trading view looks different. Well, we'll you the screenshot. Um, you know, it could be depending on the provider that's providing the price. You know, because I noticed that there's these multiple providers the quoting, say, pound dollar, right? Um, if I go to the IDC feed for pound dollar and go to the flash crash, uh, it shows me a low of 19, 119.43. If I go to the FXCM feed, it shows me a, a different price. I think it's 1905. Yeah, 1905, right there. And I know it only sounds like you know 40 pips, but it does make a difference in the Fibonacci retracement values when I do an overlay. Um, if possible, Victoria, please uh, please send it to me on Twitter. Um, I'm really, really, really bad with emails. I am like six months or so behind, at least. Um, but yeah, love to help you out if I can. Uh, from Moreno, Kiwi dollar seems to be short term bullish. How would you estimate it? That's right in my wheelhouse as well, my friend. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan on getting super amped up with uh, short dollar positions right now because, as I shared a little earlier, I think the bias is moving back to the upside. Um, but, you know, this has been a legit move after a support break. We're still kind of resolving around the 7205 level, but higher low after a very recent short-term higher high. If I wanted to wait for some confirmation, I could use this resistance as a support level after this thing breaks up. You know, let it run to prove the buyers will be able to run it and then look to buy support. You know, if I ever have uncertainty on a setup, that's usually what I'm going to do. I'm rarely ever going to force a trade. The only time I might ever do that is if I'm going to force like a few trades that, uh, and, and force is the wrong word, but if I'm going to kind of basket them together. Um, you know, I'll do something where I'll take like a hedged approach, too long dollar, too short dollar types of ideas. And, you know, that way it, you know, it, it helps obviate some of the trouble around timing because uh, it allows me to stay a little more balanced rather than just trying to be a sniper to hit one pair at a time. More of a thematic type of trade or, or idea. Uh, from Pete, uh, Osceola, it looks like it's just basing to me. Thanks for looking at it. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I think this is something that that as human beings we have a tendency to suffer from a type of myopia. I know I do. I mean, I get, you know, caught up in my day-to-day -day life. I, you know, lose idea of, of what's going on in the big picture. You know, not as bad as, like, forgetting my anniversary or anything like that. Um wife would probably kill me, but, you know, I'll have a tendency to forget a lot of birthdays and things like that. It's just, it's not because I don't love these people. It's just because I'm so caught up in my day-to-day -day life. I think markets get that way too, where, you know, a trader or traders can get so fixated on a short-term chart observation that they lose track of the bigger picture, right, of, of, of what those longer-term trends are saying. Um, you know, here on the hourly, this is definitely a strong uptrend. We've run up to some resistance, but it's been relatively clean. But like Pete was saying, it, it could just be, you know, kind of a longer-term basing formation. If I look at this on the daily, this basing could be, could have been taking place for like more than a year. But you know, we look at this on the monthly, and it seems very rational for this to be building a support base after a big move lower, and you know, something that could lead into a move of strength. Perspective is a powerful thing in life and in trading. 
All right, I'm gonna have to take the last couple comments of the day because we are running out of time, my friends. Uh, but let's see, let's see what we can do here. Uh, Matthew Bunner, thoughts on shorting Euro pound at these levels of the stop 8708. Thanks. Take a look. My litmus for doing anything on Euro pound is, is usually incredibly high because it has a tendency to be a fairly hard ranger. Uh, where it ranges quite a bit. You're saying a short off of 8708. Uh, I probably would not be that comfortable with that, Matthew. I mean, I, I you know I see a couple points of resistance back here that have worked out pretty well, but you know if I'm just focusing on the short-term move, and again this includes you know an ECB announcement where yeah right here. ECB announcement where they threw another, you know, throw of QE in there. Um, if I'm trading this in abstention, I want to look at this as a setup of strength. You know, we just ran up, caught resistance off a 23.6, fit retracement of a longer term, bigger picture move. So it makes sense for why buyers would have dried up, why sellers would have come in. Um, but now we're getting support at what could be a higher low. Yeah, so if, I, if I'm trading this setup right now, I think that's the way that I'm going to want to look at it. Is, uh, a little bit more of a bullish banner. There we go. Yeah, you know, kind of using this as the prospect of a higher low, and then if that doesn't hold, you know, let it break down and uh, eat a relatively tight stop. Yeah, that'd be about the best I could do with it right now, I think. Well, there might be another short thesis here for you. Not a big fan of drawing trend lines and you know on recently completed candles. But you know, if I'm looking for a short thesis, then basically I just need a line in the sand. And you know, I might be able to use something like this. So I might be able to trade an outside break. You know, if it breaks below this low, it breaks below that trend line, then you know, maybe I could look at a continuation type of theme. That might be something there. It is going to be a little more aggressive than what I traditionally do with Euro Yen though. Or a Euro pound, excuse me. Uh from Pete. Uh, trying to look at longer term charts more as a part of my weekend routine review. Monthlies for context, in my opinion, are a must. I am a big fan on those longer term charts. And uh, I was, for a long time, I did scalping webinars. So, you know, the bulk majority of the session would be spent down here on a, like a five minute chart or whatever. But most of the decisions that I was making on this five minute chart were determined by what I've seen on the hourly, on the four hour, the daily, maybe even the weekly and the monthly. Because what does this price have on the hourly that it does not have on the daily? Nothing. It's the same price. You're just looking at it in a different way. Same thing with this one-minute chart. What does this have that that doesn't? Nothing. It's the same thing. You're just getting a greater degree of granularity by looking at 1,440 one-minute candles. Actually, I probably messed up that math. No, 1,440 one-minute candles as opposed to 24 one-hour candles. All right, just more granularity. Now, with that granularity comes less consistency because there's less opinions, there's less trades going into each and every one of these. So there's a higher probability to see an errant movement that's going to reverse on a shorter term chart just because there's fewer voices, uh, fewer trades, less consistency, etc. But you know, in reality, I think all these time frames can work really well together. You know, and, and uh, I always present it from trying to see into a room through a keyhole, which I guess sounds pretty creepy. But, you know, imagine that it's your house and you lock yourself out of a room and you want to see if your, your dog or cat is in there. Let's say that. And you want to make sure that they're okay. So, you look in that keyhole from the side, you're only going to see the other middle half of the actual keyhole. You want to see into the room, you have to line up through it perfectly by looking through the front all the way through the back. It's very similar to looking at like the five minute chart to get that front end view and then the daily chart to get that room view. So that way your vision is as good as possible with the tools that you have at your disposal. <laughs> Pete, <laughs> it's too funny man. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to reserve that domain. <laughs> Um, 
All right, last question of the day from Angel Bonet. Angel, I hope that all is well today. Uh, it appears to be moving similar to Euro dollar. They seem to be in lockstep, Kiwi and Euro. Why would that be? Um, USD. When we get an environment, and I'm not saying that this is exactly what we have right now, but when we get an environment where there's not a significant amount of drive on the other side of the currency pair, right? So in this case, if there's not a ton of news on the Kiwi, if there's not a ton of news on the Euro, which there has been a lot of news on the Euro today. We had ECB, but it didn't elicit much of a reaction. But when you have you know, kind of an absence of drivers in each of those themes, right? In essence, you're trading the same type of thing which is heavy emphasis or focus on the US dollar, right? And so that's why when I do these webinars, I usually present it from a perspective of these are the dollar strength setups I'm looking at, these are the dollar weakness setups that I'm looking at. Because often that'll be one uniform type of message that we'll see across many of these major pairings, where if the dollar's strong, it's going to show up to some degree in the euro, it's going to show up to some degree in the sterling, and if it doesn't, well, then that right there is something that I could try to take advantage of, right? Um, but really good question. I think that's a, you know, I, I think those kind of observations are very key for, you know, understanding exposure outlay and how you're going to manage the various bits of exposure that you might uh, be taking risk on. Um, but really good question. <laughs> From Pete. Yep. Excellent observation, my friend. The entirety of this morning's ECB move has retraced. So thank you for playing Mr. Mario Draghi. We will see you next month. Your dollar now up on the day. Fantastic. And again, supported off that bullish trend line projection. Uh, but that, my friends, is what I have for today. Uh, I want to see as many of you folks back into the room next week as humanly possible. Um, give me a quick second. I got a link for you so that if you want to sign up for that Tuesday webinar, you may absolutely do so uh, right in here. There we go. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to let us know. I do my absolute best to help out as much as I can right here on the Twitter feed. I'm going to put this in the chat box. There we go. Uh, so feel free to just hit that button. Start talking to me. I'll help you out wherever I can. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. And as always, happy trading, ladies and gentlemen.